And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. <laughs> we are be we are back once again, doing t doing um doing two 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 po two podcast episodes back back to back. Um, who'd have thunk it? I mean, but, why not? But it is October. It is spoopy time. Um, you'll not see me. You'll not see me change my change my avatar or put. Or put up, or put some spoopy equivalent title because one, everybody else is doing that, and two, um, why would I, why, why would I do, why would I do that? <laughs> I'm, it's the same, re it's the same reason I don't participate in National Talk Like a Pirate Day. I always advocate play a pirate themed game instead. Oh fuck! Just sing a shanty. Just do it, tenor. Ten or twelve miles away. I mean, alternatively, you can also uh, just, you know, lazy town it up. I was gonna say Ailstorm, but that works. Ailstorm works as well. Ailstorm is very good. Oh. Especially since um, I remember, I remember, see I remember seeing a peti I remember seeing a joke petition once to have the song "Fucked with an Anchor" be the national anthem of Scotland. I know they uh they didn't take my petition very seriously. I was very upset when they said no. <laughs> well, there there was also there was also a joke petition to um to ha to to have a to have um have a have have McGregor get a get a statue on on a um, get a statue on the mountain so that he always has the high ground. I'm surprised he didn't go for that either. They always reject my ideas. And sometimes, sometimes brilliance is not is not always understood. I know it's a curse. But with that said, I do. As I said yesterday, I do have to issue a slight correction because last week when we closed off on our look at the um, fighter. We had said we had said that this one was that this one was going to be, um, the heavens and heresies answer to the cleric. Not the case. The herald is more the answer to the bard, which um, gives me an opportunity to talk to talk about the complicated um, relationship that D and D has had with the bard class. Putting aside the fact that it really that. The whole concept of the bard started out as the as essentially the drummer boy for an army, or or the or the bagpipe guy. Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. uh, but event, but eventually we eventually you kind of integrated into 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 things like the Pied Piper of Hamelin and a lot of the um. A lot of the European um, fi um, folk heroes. Yep. But more, but more or less, it's a, it is it is meant to be a support class. And it's only been in recent years that they that they've managed to get some degree of identi identity, identity. <coughs> like the AD and D bard was an absolute fucking mess. <laughs> I mean, when hasn't the bard been a fucking mess in some way or another? Well, 4e, but we're not but we're apparently not allowed to talk about that. You missed the innuendo. <laughs> look, I can't look. I don't want to steal Mickey's gimmick. Ah, but Mickey's not here to defend herself. Yeah, but still it's the principle. True. And the thing, the thing, the thing is with the bard, 
is that the bard is one the bard is one of those archetypes that's meant to that's meant to be a jack of many trades in a system that's not designed for um multi role characters. Some now it is true that's is true that that class systems can handle classes that fill multiple roles, but usually the amount of multiple roles that are that are filled in that regard are two, and even and even then it's more like one and a half. You know, you know, a case of a fighter who could also heal, but is but is more a but is more a backup healer for the actual healer. Yeah, I get that. Whereas the whereas the um, bard, it's supposed to be able to fight in an Errol Flynn like way, play play its instruments, support and. Know a few things because it because it's picked because it's picked up a few things. Um, the prob the problem that ends up occur the problem that ends up occurring is the fact that when you're going in all those directions, you're not you're not really doing well at any of them. And class systems are at that are at their best. When every participant has that one thing that they are good that they are good at. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why classes that are very good at multiple things tend to be on the OP end of things. Hi, Codzilla. Of course. Well, Codzilla's already been half defeated here, so I don't think we have to worry about that. Yeah, it's ju it's just that it makes it's a po it's a poster boy of the, of what I'm talking about with this whole um, fulfilling multiple roles well. Yeah, no, I get that. Godzilla is definitely... It could fill everything. Literally. That was not an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. Godzilla in 3, and especially in 3.5, uh, just fulfilled everything. There was there was no around go, no, no getting around that fact. Mm-hmm. Now, with, the, with, that in, with that in mind... the um the other the other the other major issue with the bard and this is i will admit that this is mostly this is mostly an issue that's um cr that's created because of art more than anything else is the musical hang up that people have with bards much in the much in the same way that people still think charisma is physical attractiveness Instead of force of personality. Mm -hmm. Bar, the, uh, I will I will put it out there right now. The concept of what a bard is does not necessarily need an instrument. In this regard, I always bring up um, Varric Tethras from Drag from Dragon Age Two and Dragon Age Inquisition. He, mm -hmm. you don't, he is definitely a bard, but mm -hmm. you'll never see him with an instrument. Yeah. Um, there is a there is a one of your first companions in Pathfinder Kingmaker is definitely definitely has that whole musical e edge to some of her spells, but a good sh but a good chunk of her bardness is chronicling your exploits. You know, with this with this in universe idea of your of the all the notes that all the notes that you're reading are are uh, from her journal mm. doesn't fully commit to that idea but the sent but the sentiment is still there yeah like can, and especially a lot of a lot of people have this have this idea of the of the of the bard in the wandering minstrel kind of approach, mm -hmm. and while that certainly that is certainly one way that it can that it can manifest, it's not the only way. No, especially what, and this especially goes for the whole. You um, you should be able to do multiple interpretations of a class if we're going to do this whole. Well, D and D's for D and D's for all kinds of fantasy. You know that some pe that some people still insist is the case. We call these people wrong. Uh mm -hmm. And 
the now grant now granted um Tanner has his own issues with bards as he made clear to us in his in his response to um to what we talked to the when we when we brought this up last week yeah but I had asked him to I had asked him if he could give me a statement going into going into his issues and I'd like to read off what he what he had said before we really before we delve into the herald proper yeah said quote for me bard just as a genre is super specific already then to add a billion different subcategories to it is just for me stretches the concept paper thin there's also the inherent problem that a bard in any sort of fantasy setting is just not an inherently magical concept but a lot of games try to force magic onto it and so most of the time it presents itself like a mismatched wasteland of concepts like i have no problem with people wanting to be singers and performers I think it fits into the game really well. But most of the time, bard classes have very little to do with singing or performing mechanically or even narratively. Like, a bard fits into a game really well, but a bard, quote-unquote, with, with a capital B, always seemed like, pe like people were forcing the issue, and a lot of the time, bards play like better rogues in, mo in most games, which is also annoying. So for my design, I wanted to take the playstyle of supporting the party and widen it into a larger thematic grouping, Herald, and then look at it, and then look at these specific instances that larger thematic, that of that larger thematic category, sorry, and split it into the concepts slash archetypes that I saw most often. I think the other issue I had was that the bard class in 5e always tended to create problems in games when I ran public games at the local game shop. Everyone had a different idea on what a bard was or should be, and those expectations would clash with other players at the table, making it just a not fun experience. Plus, most that guy players I had at my table tended to play bards. Some would play rogues, but most knew that bards were better rogues, so they would play bards and try their hardest to make the game fun only for them and unfun for the other nine people I had at my table. I generally had groups of nine or ten people at the local game shop. When the local game shop had D and D night. D and D nights were a Kafka esque nightmare. Nine or ten people, Jesus. Yeah, that's a pretty big group to be DMing. I usually cap uh, single DM groups at eight. And that's, you know, for people that you're very well familiar with. If it's randos at your friendly local game store, that's that's asking for trouble. No offense. <laughs> I usually ca Mine usually capped it at five um, players. If they did anything more than that, it was because they had multiple people... D um, DMing. DMing. You had sub-DMs and stuff, yeah. Uh He also, he also added that he didn't like that bards don't fit into the main character role. There have been a few, he brings up the bard's tale, but the bard is generally only a supporting role. I wanted there to be a choice. If you want to be in a supporting role, that's totally awesome, and they should be able to do that. But if they don't, I find that Herald as a concept, or Harbinger even, much more readily allows for that choice. Like for, Her like for Heavens and Heresies, it's a lot easier to craft a narrative focused on a herald acting as the harbinger of valor than it is to build one around the bard who knows the school of valor, even though he never really visits the school, nor is it apparent that if that school exists in the GM's world. Um, I would I, I, I would say that herald is a good name. Uh, harbinger has a, a connotation to it that uh, I, uh, I would hesitate to use harbinger if I were GMing, but that's just me. I can I can see that, and it's funny that it's funny that Tanner brings up the whole um co the whole colleges thing, because in the in the player's handbook there's this implication that bards go go out and will and will revisit these different colleges to swap stories that they've come swap stories and folk tales and the like that they've come across throughout the world, except um once again this is the we come back to that age that age old issue that I've talked about. Many times, and I'm probably going to keep bringing it up until I'm dead. Implied setting. Mm-hmm. Im a set a setting with a setting without a setting. There is I know that I know that there is the claim that Forgotten Realms is the default setting for D and D fifth edition, but um, as w as w as has happened for the longest time, this is done half-assed. 
The reason why I keep bringing up this whole this whole implied setting thing is you can't do the, you you can't have you can't have those particular implications while at the same time w wanting to claim that you that you can set it up for all kinds of fantasy. They don't mm -hmm. mix. Mhm. Mm and with with that in mind, when it comes to the when it comes to the herald we're go this is this is going to be an opportunity to de to delve it to delve into exa exactly exactly how it's handled here especially since once again we have the return of a spellcasting class yep it is indeed so since you've since you've read through since you've read through the um the set the setup in each of, in each of the open the opening preamble with these um, <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <clears throat> i'm already reading that one and regretting it and uh you're going to regret it here soon too so uh <clears throat> let me channel my best inner uh inner snooty By Titania's grace, you want to hear more about me? Well, I know that other adventurers are wont to talk about themselves, but I'd much rather hear about you, about your story. No story to tell. I think you mean no story to tell yet. Because a story you shall have, and I will make it beautiful for the world to hear. I will make you beautiful. I will help you guide you in all your endeavors. I will be your muse, your trusted ally on whom you can always rely. And your enemies? They shall suffer my disfavor. They shall never feel warmth from my gaze. I will make them ugly, weak, helpless. They will be shackled with ineffable loneliness, and I will curse their very existence. You shall shine among them in brilliance, a light in the darkness. Come, adventurer, let us write your story together. Isabel Vargos, half-elven herald of beauty. Thanks. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I channel my inner snooty, I channeled my inner drag queen. <clears throat> now you hate it even more, don't you? <laughs> Urge to kill, rising... Ah, uh, monk. If I died, what would you do without me, though? Get 50,000 GP worth of diamonds and cast Raise Dead. <laughs> Why, so you could kill me yourself? <laughs> Trust well, me, viewers, either, I either know that, him well. Either that, or, either that, or just go, just go down and ask and ask the and ask the devil. I know you're here, you big fucking nerd. Where's my goddamn money? Okay, Moon Knight. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, Moon Knight, you lunatic. Anyway, you got any shrooms? <laughs> For anyone who doesn't get those jokes, go look up Moon Knight Core. Oh, yes. And anyways. So the core... The core ability requirement is intuition, which is going to be your spell casting ability for spells. Use intuition whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability, or or when you or when making an attack roll with a spell, you cast. Um, I think there's supposed to be a space here. You cast or. Yeah. This is not caster wheels or caster oil. Caster oil is disgusting. <clears throat> uh, wait, what? I didn't say anything. <sighs> or skill attack that you use. So that's one little type. That's one little typo. Um. See, then we have proficiencies. Sorry about the pa sorry about the pause there. 
So, you, so you're proficient with light armor. You have simple proficiency with four weapon subcategories. You have proficiency with your intuition defense. Uh, you also get one based on your archetype. And looking looking a bit further down, you actually get your archetype right out of the gate, which I don't think any of the vanilla 5e classes do that. No, they don't. In fact, let me um, let me du let me double check that. As I am, fa I'm f I'm fairly certain that at most, it's seen at um for at first level. Mm -hmm. Or not first level at um. It's third, a, second or third usually. Yeah, it's usually it's usually um it's usually second or third or um third or third. So let me let me go. Let me go up. To, let me go up to my arc to my little archive. So let's see. Um, in fact, I distinct, I distinctly remember bringing that, bringing that up. Um, Arteviser, third level. Um, Blood Hunt, Blood Hunter, the, oh, the class that was brought, the class that was brought up because my critical role. Um, also third level. Cleric, um, sec, second level. Yeah, most, like I said, most are third level. Mm-hmm. Most are third level. A few of them are a few of them are second level, and there is no real defi real defining <coughs> structure. Just a um, which is t which I think is telling. So so the whole thing of getting one based on their archetype um, is going to make a bit more sense. I had raised my eyebrow at that at first, but then I saw the class table. And I'm like, okay, I see where this is going. Um, you gain proficiency in a skill of your choice, and you can learn two languages which best match your message. Um, Whatever your message happens to be. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and you have a number of vitality equal to half your level plus your intuition modifier. Yep. So they're not getting the huge amounts of vitality that Druid are, but they're also not bloodcasters. So. Let's see, and then we get to the raise the death flag. When <laughs> Harold raises the death flag, they are instantly restored to full HP, may grant inspiration as a free action on their turn without expending resources, may place their inspiration on themselves if they could not do so already, and may choose an additional secondary option for all of their spells, which does not count against the total amount of secondary options they may choose for a spell. So, Bardic... Well, I mean, it, it, it's Bardic Inspiration, but it's just Inspiration here. Her Heraldric Inspiration. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, as a free action, without spending any of their stocked inspirations and also put it on themselves if they if they can't already do so which i'm guessing there's probably some some archetypes here that allow you to do so mm -hmm. and then of course the ever awesome more secondary options option of i'm gonna die so my spells are even better now Remember, everybody, as cool as raising the death flag is, and I don't know if we need to hammer this in every time, but I probably will, you're gonna die afterwards. Period. You you are sacrificing this character to get a super boost to potentially pull the rest of the party out of the fucking fire, so... And, the, the, no, <laughs> and no, we, we are not going to allow you to pull, a, to pull the Staff of Resurrection loop from... Um, from Darkness Rising. Nor are we going to allow you to make 55 or so character sheets just so you can pull the same character in multiple times only to die again seconds later. The only time I again. do, the only time I'd allow that is so I can put all of them through a paper shredder, put the, put the, rema put the remains of that in the cannon and, um, shoot, and shoot it at their face. Confetti cannon. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, you get one tier one armor, one weapon, one tier one potion or poison, and one adventuring kit. Which we 
we haven't gone into at length, but uh, the um, much like when I looked at the equipment list last time, looking at you know the the short um, short little blurbs about weapons, which was funny because one of the things uh, Tan Tanner said in his notes regarding it uh, was that was that. Uh, he didn't know that we were going to be going through the weapons, um, and that's how he writes flavor text a lot of the time when he needs a placeholder. So, I say keep some of it. I do too. Like Smash Bash, <laughs> that was a good one. Like, what can I? Um, I'm I'm of my favorite flavor text instances in in Magic were always the more humorous ones. So of course, nearly every uncard then. Oh, uh, nearly, <laughs> nearly every uncard, as well as um, as well there were sev as well as some of the more dark humor cards in original Ravnica. Yeah. Um, and and some and some because it doesn't have to be obvious humor like the Un series. Sometimes it can be dry, dry or even dark humor. Yeah, I just, I think. Uh... I think the un series of cards, even with some of their obvious humor, are still real bangers when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. I w like I w the one that's, the one that always sticks with me is the is the old um, is the old deflection. Mm -hmm. Largely because largely because it's written in rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> back down so over and through back jump up down over and through now back around the jokes on you. So uh. But just to just to go over the adventuring kits a second, mm -hmm. since we we've encountered our first default adventuring kit, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, it starts with the developer's note: the kits here are how I solve for the fact that most people don't know what they need to go exploring, even GMs. The kits help solve that issue for people. The specific items included in a kit are supposed to be nebulous. You are given items that are relevant to a particular task described in the kit. Explorers' kits have things that help you explore. Skullduggery kits have things that let you steal and pick locks, much like the uh, lock pick I'm the lock pick set I'm actually building in real life right now. <clears throat> All the materials you need for those tasks are included in the kit and its encumbrance, rather than tracking each and every item a character has, which is a pain. And most people have no idea what they would need to bring to survive in the wilderness or travel by foot cross country. I need to add this blurb more above, more fully to the kits below, but wanted people to get a good idea as to where they are heading. Um, and so the table, Explorer's Kit, Encumbrance of Two, Currency, Cost of Mundane, contains items useful for exploring new terrain. Uh, examples include compass rope, grappling hook, small waterproof satchel, torch, chalk, climbing pinions, etc. Survivor's Kit, Currency, Cost of Mundane, Encumbrance Two, they're all in uh, currency cost of, of mundane, and all but the navigator's kit is encumbrance two. Navigator's kit is encumbrance one. Um, survivor's kit contains items useful for when trying to survive off the wilderness: small snare traps, fire starter, tents, water skins, camping equipment, etc. Chronicler's kit contains everything you need to chronicle your adventures: pen, parchment, blank notebooks, etc. Bounty hunter's kit. Contains the tools necessary to bind a prisoner and bring them to into a city in order to collect their bounty. Manacles, rope, rags to stifle the verbal components of casters. Mmm. The idea of gagging an elven caster. That brings music to our ears, monk. Navigator's kit. Don't pick this. It does nothing. Why is it here? I don't know. At some point it will do something? That's a question mark at the end, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to make a cool magical transportation crafting system at some point. But for now, don't pick this ability. It's here to remind me I need to make something. <laughs> I like that. Skullduggery kit contains items related to thieving and deception, lockpicks, disguise kits, and assortment of weights, pliers, etc. Harvester's kit well, contains items that allows a character to harvest materials from defeated foes and natural resource feigns. Now, here's here's my question about that. Something something Tanner did mention was that, you know, after encounters, there's a chance to get materials of certain tiers depending on the you know the strength of the encounter, etc. Um, will the harvester's kit simply make that 
uh, easier on what uh, on what you get, where you get more. I want a clarification of that, even though this isn't uh, understood about the class for Harold, since we do have to go through these kits as an introduction. Um, a clarification of what it means to allow characters to harvest materials. Is every going to character need a harvest? Every character going to need a harvester's kit in order to harvest materials, or does this somehow give additional benefit to getting materials? That's what I want to know. I'm going, then, I'm going to I'm going to guess um, that it's not a case where everybody would need it because that would go against the team play theme that he seems to be going for with this game. And I agree there. I'm just I want a clarification because. Uh, there are going to be those sorts of questions asked, especially by newbies. There are people who have never played TTRPGs or have barely played TTRPGs. They're going to ask that question of, do I need this to get materials? Especially and, any um, any D and D refugees. Yeah. Now this may be, no this this won't be answered answered uh, further down. It's not even in the list of. Oh no, it is. Okay. It it, it it'll. Oh no, it's just a longer description, and yeah. <clears throat> and then finally, we have healer's kit, and it says test <laughs> contains items useful for recovering after a fight. Splints, bandages, non-magical herbs for remedies won't be able to treat anything serious, but will help others recover in a minor way. So, um, again, this sounds like it's going to provide a benefit to normal healing rather than being necessary for healing. But those clarifications do need to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are longer descriptions of some of the kits. Not all of them have been filled. Um, and the... Uh, ah, he, so for the healer's kit, the, the, the longer description says... While you have this kit in your inventory, you heal for one additional hit point whenever you expend vitality to regain hit points during a moment of pushing forward. So, you get extra... Like I said, it's an extra benefit to healing. Mm -hmm. You may also give the benefits of this kit to another creature, but the benefits of a healer's kit may only be applied to one creature each time you push forward, and the effect of a healer's kit do not stack with itself. In addition, you may use your action to purge the bleeding condition from yourself or another creature within melee reach of you, even if you do not have the proficiency in the nature skill. And there's a, a side note uh, from one of the earlier testers. Uh, in 5e, the healer's kit has a number of uses, but it is so useless in that system that nobody cares. Maybe you could add a system where the kit has X number of uses, and each time you use one of its benefits, you expend a use, and you could gain uses back by harvesting medicinal herbs or going to a town. Uh, and then, of course, Tanner responds, I don't like the 5e healer's kit because it pretends magical healing doesn't exist. But I do like the idea of giving it more things it can do in this system. Most of the things here go on the one-per-push-forward mechanic. Mm -hmm. Also, there are probably a ton of ghosts in the descriptions. I haven't checked for short rest ghosts as, as carefully here. <laughs> Replacing short rest with pushing forward, I'm guessing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then in the Harvester's Kit, this actually doesn't define if there is a, a benefit. Um, it says, Adventuring is difficult. One often needs to climb, spelunk, crawl, and swim. But what many adventurers lose sight of is the fact that adventuring has a purpose. Reward. The Harvester's Kit allows you to harvest the rare materials hidden within those locations, whether it be the scales of a fallen dragon, the sap of a legendary tree in a druid, hidden in a druid's grove, or a, pre a precious gemstone tucked away in the core of a volcano. The Harvester's Tool will let you harvest all of those things. So, it sounds to me like it, uh, it's going to be a way to raise maybe the grade of the uh, of the materials you can harvest in a location after an encounter. But it would be a little it would be a little bit better to have that more in a more concrete terms. Um, descriptions only only so uh, so can only be so much. And then. Uh, just because the Navigator's Kit is already so humorous, I'm also going to read the Navigator's Kit uh, longer uh, description and the testing notes that were added to it. Navigator's Kit, you were warned. You put this back right now. It doesn't actually do anything. It just sits there in your inventory like your other items used to do. But you need that space now. 
And uh, the tester was like, I don't know if you've tackled rules yet for traveling, but it might be interesting if this acted kind of like a game map in online RPGs, where the adventurers can keep not all of the places they have visited or have knowledge of, and then they get some kind of travel bonus. Uh, keep note. Uh, keep note, not keep not, but mm. he's accidentally typed not. And then they might get some kind of travel bonus going there. Alternatively, it might provide some bonus to spotting creatures that the players have interacted with. If they know that there are goblins in some area marked on the map, they have some bonus to spot and interact with them. Uh, Tanner responds, yeah, something like that, though that might just be more the Explorer's Kit. Right now, this is just in here as a little joke. And to remind me that I have a whole companion and travel and vehicle section in the works. Ah, oh, man, the Navigator's Kit just makes me laugh. This is, this is the kit you need if you want to use an airship. Mm-hmm. That's my that's my uh my head cannon at this point. <laughs> and unlike but, other head cannons, that will not get the head cannon. Because airships are always awesome, even Ash would agree. But essentially, you get to this is like I said, this is the first class where you get a, an adventuring kit of your choice at the beginning as part of the class. I think that there were mentions of getting adventuring kits from other parts, such as your your ancestries and, and your backgrounds and such. Mm -hmm. Um. I might have to go back and look at that, and I could be completely wrong, and Tanner will correct me in the notes that he gives us, and I will always appreciate those corrections. Yeah. Uh, but with that, we move on to the features. Mm -hmm. So, I know that I know that was a bit scattershot, but since since there was a pick an adventurer kit instead of get instead of having one specific, um, I think it, I think it was warranted. It was. Plus, I just like reading the other parts of his book, um, scattershot. And confusing the hell out of everybody before we go to that section proper. Yeah. I'm an agent of chaos. Chaos incarnate, in fact. So, at the start, we have spell casting, which, as a herald, you know a number of spells, as shown in the herald spell casting table. You're able to amplify those spells with spell points. You gain a number of spell points, as also shown on the table. For each spell point you spend, you may choose one additional secondary effect. The secondary effect limit chart allow shows the maximum number of secondary options. Sorry, carbonation. The maximum number of spell points you may have at any given time is dependent on your level, and you gain all of your expended spell points after a rest. In addition, whenever you push forward, you regain a number of spell points depending on your level, the number of spell points you recover, and your maximum spell points are shown on the tape table under the recoverable spell point section and the maximum spell point section respectively. At 5th, 11th, and 17th level you may choose one additional secondary option each time you cast a spell without spending spell points. So we have the, the free uh, the free spell uh, the, the free spell um, secondary options but it looks like uh you only get three, 5, 11th, and 17th. Mm -hmm. is you know one additional uh, secondary option without spending spell points. Yeah, you I don't get that, and that you don't get in that initial first one that Druid got, which, as uh, Tanner pointed out, Druid was the master of secondary options. Yeah, because I'm lo I'm looking at the I'm looking at the capstones for each at the high, um, Druid, um, Druids and Heralds both are both going to have the. Uh, both both going to have a rel a relatively similar amount amount of spells known, although it looks like it looks like druids cap out faster. Um, yeah. But when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to spell points, the the herald is gonna is going to cap out higher at ten, whereas the druid would on would only cap out at six. And the a, druid got seven at a at twentieth. No, no, the dru the druid get the druid, um, gets six at fourteenth and stays that way for the rest of it. That's right. Um, and when it comes to recoverable spell points, it, that caps out at eight at eight. Um, and and. The se the secondary eff the secondary effect limit for is hi is higher mm -hmm. on the on the uh, herald. The the big the biggest thing with the druid was that it had more freeze. Mm -hmm. It got free it got uh free 
free secondary options to add in. It's just their limit was lower, and uh, the spell points essentially were lower too. Mm-hmm. So you you get to add more, you get to be more effective without spending resources as a druid. Yeah, that's what that means. Um, next, the other one that we have is Inspiration of the Herald. So on your uh, turn, go ahead. Before before we move on beyond from the Herald spell spellcasting list, the Dev Note is important. Mm-hmm. A small note about spellcasting. In H&H, you can cast spells for free. They don't take up any resources unless you want to channel secondary effects into them. Then they start costing resources. But spellcasting classes and number of feats allow you to choose free secondary options for spells, which don't cost resources. Of course, you can always use your resources to amplify the spells further. In this way, I don't need separate lists of cantrips and then another list for spells. In addition, I don't need 40 different fire spells, just the one spell, fire, and a number of secondary options for the ways that spell can be amplified. Also, in a lot of the spellcasting classes, you'll see levels where they don't appear to get anything. All classes all classes don't get anything at 4, 8, 12, 16, and 19 because Ancestry gives you stuff then. This is because the spellcasting classes generally get boosts to their spell stuff at those empty slots. It's just marked in the other chart. But in Heavens and Heresies, you have no dead levels. You get something at every level. Which is actually, you know, quadruple thumbs up there. I mean, if I had more, if I had more arms, there would be so many thumbs. I, I, uh, so many thumbs. I'm throwing all the thumbs. This is uh, the the Shin Mazinger 100 rocket punch thumbs up version. <laughs> oh, especially since dead le- dead levels is so- is something that um something that something that um, we have complained about constantly. Oh, oh yeah, and I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that the uh, the adi- the addition every hipster says we're not supposed to like um actually addressed that it actually addressed that problem. And if you if it seems if it seems if it seems annoying that I keep calling it the addition we're not supposed to like, I will always and forever take the piss out of ev- out of every single motherfucker who kept giving me shit for the for the fact that I liked the, for, that I liked 4E, and I am not going to stop giving them shit. And uh, I'm I'm not going to give anybody shit for anything regarding 4E. Other than grognards being grognards, because I didn't get a chance to play it. But every time I hear anyone talk about it, I wish I had. I now, wish I had gotten a chance to play it. And now you, and, and once it, once again, this is what this is why this is why I don't put OSR on my on my t- on any on any of my IDs. Yep, of course. Um, I, w- I would also like to say that you, you missed a chance to use your line about how everyone is a cremated equal. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that's on me. Um, I had to point it out, monk. I'm sorry. Got to keep you informed. No worries. I get. I gotcha. So next we have inspiration of the herald, also at first level, which is going to be the inspiration the inspiration rule and. I'd like to I'd like to dip back into the way Bardic Inspiration works in Vanilla Five E. Okay. Um, in that the comparison case, does need to be made. Yeah. Bardic Inspiration, you use a bonus action to choose one creature other than yourself within sixty feet, who gets a D six and can use that to boost an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw. And this can be done after it rolls the D twenty if they so choose, but it has to decide before the DM says whether the roll succeeds or fails. What, um, once it's rolled, it's lost, and you don't. And you can you can use it a number of times equal to your charisma modifier, and regain expended uses after a long rest. Yep. Um, it looks like the the first section of Inspiration of the Herald is word for word, um, in the effect. Mm-hmm. basically the same 
Uh, once on, on your turn, you may expend a vitality and use a quick action, 10 feet, to choose one creature other than yourself within 60 feet of you who can hear you. That creature gains one inspiration die, a d6. Important that he mentions that can hear you. If you're under some sort of zone of silence, you can't use inspiration. Unless you have telepathy. Could they cast telepathy? Is there a way to cast telepathy, Tanner? Let me know. You gave me the list of spells. I don't know if there's a modifier that allows you to use telepathy. So, that's good. I want to know now. I want to know! Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, once within the next ten minutes, that creature can roll the die and add the number rolled to one ability check, attack roll, or ability defense. That's basically word for word the same, except for with his mechanics rather than the mechanics of base. Um, the creature can wait until after it rolls the d20 before deciding to use the inspiration die, but must decide before the GM says whether the roll succeeds or fails. Once the die is rolled, it is lost. Mm -hmm. that, that's almost, like I said, that small section right there, almost word for word the same as core. But from what we already know about the system, that's more impactful, in my opinion. Especially, especially, given, the, especially given the fact that we're not dealing with the whole resting bullshit. We have a vitality system for that instead. And two, is the, is the is the is what comes after that, and this is where things get interesting. Mm -hmm. When a creature with an inspiration die from from you takes damage from an attack, you may use your reaction in order to remove the inspiration from it and protect that creature. The creature rolls the inspiration die and adds your intuition modifier, reducing the damage it takes by the total. This can reduce damage to zero. An ally with an inspiration die from you may also may also choose to use its own reaction to remove the inspiration from it and protect itself. It still adds your intuition modifier. I'm guessing that even if it chooses to do it with its own reaction, since it's still all the same skill, it's the same type of damage reduction that reduces that can potentially reduce damage to zero. Mm -hmm. All right. That would that would make sense, and of course you can only of course you can only have one inspiration die as a feature, unless a feature says otherwise. Um, a creature can only have one inspiration die at a time. This this still means that uh, a herald could expend a vitality, give it to one ally, expend another vitality, give one to a second ally throughout the throughout the the encounter, um, which is fun. I like that idea. The I, fact that, I like the fact the... <laughs> that you can use this to get to give to give a um to give a kind of damage par a, give a kind of damage parachute that either either they can use or you or the herald can use mm -hmm. does ch does change a lot of the dynamics with this um setup. Yeah, um, and then of course at higher levels, your inspiration die type changes when you reach certain levels. D8 at 5th level, D10 at 10th, and D12 at 15th. That's fantastic. Let me... Ch that's... That's the same... That's the same rate as as the... Um, inspiration... As the die, in, die for um, Bardic Inspiration in Core. But, once again, that's... That second part of... That second part of it... Um, has a lot of implications. And like I said, not not only from the second part, but even just using the stuff that is basically ripped from core, um, because of the changes to the system that Tanner has made, it's a lot more impactful even there. It's it's just better because of the the way the system has been rebuilt from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, and thirdly, thirdly for first level, we have the Herald archetype. Like I like I said, this is the first. This is the first we've seen in these explorations. Period, where you have to pick a subclass right out of the gate. There's not a whole lot of pre not a whole lot of precedent for this, and I get the feeling that once we get to the archetypes, we'll see why that was done. In fact, he had, in fact, there's a dev note saying. In Heavens and Heresies, I wanted to stay away from any one class being, by definition, religious in general. All of the classes can be religious if they want, but being religious isn't necessarily part of any one class. Even the vessel is not required to be religious, although it is not barred from being religious either. The Herald functions in the same way. A player is more than welcome to play a religious Herald bearing the message of a divine being, 
but they could just as easily not incorporate any talk of deities or demons into their character and have the message be self-inspired instead. This, um... I wonder... I, um... Based on based on the comments that he made, I want I wonder if originally the archetypes were called har, were called harbingers instead of messages, which we'll get into later. Well, and then then there's uh there's the fact that um I I do have to I do have to uh bring up the comparisons to our previous. Valley of the Judged, and it's it's hacks, um, because frankly, that's wait, what? Did they get rid of their their play tests entirely? I think I think they did because uh, because of the fact that the Kickstarter is launching next week. Yeah, but that shouldn't. They released a lot of new news since we uh since we did our stuff, but you know we're not going back to that. The thing I wanted to do was look at at um just brief comparison to their herald also being someone. I remember it was also someone devoted to a, a message or a cause. Um, um, that what that was the that was their herald, which was their um answer to Paladin. Yeah. But that that does I, that does put a few things into perspective regarding regarding some of the classes that we'll be tackling later on in this series. Mm -hmm. Regardless, um, the, the 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 main comparison I wanted to make was that uh, this purpose, or or in this case, this message can come from a divine being, a demonic presence, a force of nature, or even one's own determination. But the message itself is what grants you power, which was very much the same for the Herald for Level Up 5e. But unlike Level Up 5e, um, it wasn't just a different flavor to the normal process. Mm -hmm. You know, the, Here, this is very much baked in in a way that is impactful in level up 5e like i said it's just another flavor to the to a similar process as in core so again i'm looking forward to seeing how these archetypes work out because i already i already liked um tormenting you with my my best uh sultry voice uh sultry voiced half elf of uh of beauty so uh I want to see how this works. Yeah. So, so let's get through the rest of core first. <laughs> core features. Yeah. So next is Bringer of Rest, which seems to be um, this this game's version. This game's answer to Song of Rest. When you push forward, you and allies within sixty feet of you may regain one additional vitality. At seventh, eleventh, and seventeenth and twentieth level, you may regain one additional vitality with this feature. Um, it's a nice little dev note there. This feature seems nondescript, but it fundamentally changes the way the game can be played. It's a sleeper feature and is so subtly powerful. Um, considering that it regains vitality during push forward, whereas push forward is also where you spend vitality to get hit points. This is something you could do during a push forward for something like your druid. Hey, druid buddy, run low on spending from HP? What do you want, you knife-eared fuck? <laughs> you, uh, need, need, some, need, some, need some vitality there? You know I do. <laughs> Say it. No. <laughs> Say it. I ain't gonna say what you want me to say, you knife-eared bastard. <laughs> and I just imagine that the elf and the dwarf are going to fight over who gets the vitality. <laughs> and the dwarf might just go, if you don't stop, I'll beat the ever-living hell out of you. And you'll lose more vitality than I will. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I'm creating a cracked version of your world, Tanner. How does it feel? <laughs> and anyway, um, especially since at tw at twentieth, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Five vital at twentieth level. Everyone around you is getting five points of vitality. What the fuck? Including you. It says <laughs> you and your allies within sixty feet of you. Again, what the fuck? I can see why he called it a sleeper feature. And it it gains those additional uh, vitality. And remember, everybody, there's hit points, there's vitality, and there's willpower. There's three different resources talked about concerning. Whether you live or die. And vitality is, as the name implies, much more vital than just normal ass hit points. Because you don't necessarily become unconscious at zero HP in this game. Um, so, yes. This is, this is the next layer down. The vitality layer of, of your different will I live or die resources. And, uh... Restoring that much vitality when the pool for most classes is half level plus um, uh, key uh, core ability mod. Uh, like, he, for the Herald, half level, rounded up, and int mod, intuition mod. I should say intuition, because if I just say int, the grognards are going to assume intelligence. <clears throat> Which is why they have none. <laughs> uh, so, vitality is a much more limited pool compared to hit points, which are determined by your ancestry track. Um, and you at 20th level, something like, a, again, our, our, our druid dwarf that forges from the earth, um, he, uh, he would have, you know, in the 60s of HP. It, it, that's, that's a lot of HP. And so five, if it were five HP, that would not be very much. And the druid does get a larger pool of vitality, but it's still not a large, large amount. It's not going to be compared to his uh, to his pool of of HP. The vitality pool for a druid was vitality equal to half your level rounded up plus your intuition modifier plus two, and the maximum vitality increases by two at fifth, eleventh, and seventeenth levels. So, assuming an intuition modifier of, of 5, let's just assume they're at 20 intuition at this point, mm -hmm. um, at 20th level, that's 10 plus 5 plus 2 at base, 17 vitality. Plus, you know, two more at three, three other level points, that's 23 vitality, a very large pool of vitality compared to other classes. But that's still small enough that 5 of that is almost a quarter of your entire pool mm -hmm. that's huge especially for a druid who casts from vitality <clears throat> so uh for other classes where it's just half level plus mod assuming a mod of five because they have 20 in their core ability that's at 20th level 15 that's 33 percent of your vitality at, at, ignoring other bonuses you may get from ancestries feats etc uh, features within the class because those all there's always those things as well but just your base vitality five vitality is gigantic mm -hmm. so next we have cleansing inspiration at third level while affected by your inspiration your allies may at the beginning of their turn reduce the severity of a condition affecting them by one this feature cannot cleanse wounds or curses. So they have, though they have a re they have a reason to hold on to inspiration instead of just the rainy day paradox. Yeah, the rainy day of I have to keep it for when it's important, and then you never use your mega elixirs even after the super secret final boss after the final boss. Also um, known as a also known as a hidden boss in a tri ace game. <laughs> also known as a uh, as any of the post-game dungeon bosses from Star Ocean till the end of time. Star Ocean is a tri-ace game. I know, but I had to use till the end of time specifically because that entire post-game dungeon is insane and MP kills are the way to go. 
yeah. that's a different story. Mm-hmm. We won't get into that. But um, remember that there are conditions whose severities naturally reduce um, over time. Mm-hmm. As a clarification, I would it, I would say uh, I would say whether this stacks or not with that natural reduction. I assume it does. I mean, it, it would make sense why it wouldn't. But um, as we continue to tell Tanner, clarifications prevent rules lawyers as much as possible. I mean, you're always going to have a rules lawyer. But m- the more clarified uh, an instruction or a feature or anything of that matter is, the less wiggle room a rules lawyer has to work in. Of course, if you're like Monk or myself, we just tell a rules lawyer, okay, we've, we've ruled it this way. We can talk about it after the session. Just to keep the session going. Now, <clears throat> with now after after that at fifth level, you get you get a bon- you get a general feat as a bonus feat. You'll get another one at eleventh and seventeenth level. Yep. And at twentieth level, you get superior inspiration. When threatened, you and your al- and your allies within sixty feet gain one. Of your inspiration dice, this ability does not consume your vitality, but only occurs at the beginning of the encounter. So when threatened, everybody everybody just gets inspiration. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, you can only hold one inspiration, so that means you can you have to use it before you can do it again. But as we just pointed out with cleansing inspiration, it may be better to hold onto the die for a little while. Now, you may have noticed there was a big old skip from 5th to 20th, but that was already addressed by the dev note concerning the Herald spellcasting table and, in general, how leveling works mm-hmm. and how there's no dead levels. Um, as pointed out, uh, no class at 4, 12, 16, and, uh, 4, 4, 8, 12, 16, and 19 gets anything because, they get, because the character gets stuff given to them by their ancestry. Uh, and then, of course, most of the stuff that we mentioned earlier has additional stuff that happens at later levels, such as spell casting getting the additional secondary options, uh, your inspiration die changing types at different levels, uh, your uh, your um, your bringer of rest getting additional vitality at different levels, you getting bonus feats at different levels. All of these are included on the table for uh, for the class table of features, which makes the table look full, because it is. Um, but these features are introduced at the level you first get them, and then you have the additionals mentioned as just at higher levels, which, I'm going to be honest, I like that because it makes it more compact. It doesn't fluff everything out like we've seen in some editions where they list it for everything you get at every level. Mm-hmm. Um, but then on top of that, remember that you get your archetype at level one, and your archetype grants you abilities at first, sixth, tenth, fourteenth, and eighteenth. Five different level areas. First level where you get three, where you get a total of three features to start with. Um, so most of, most of the, the meat that we're really looking into, because the Herald is intrinsically tied to its message these archetypes are based on those messages and much like we saw with uh the druid and i think this i don't i i want to make a prediction now now that we are seeing two casting types it looks like with martial classes the core features you get outside of your archetype are, are already stand very well on their own and that's fantastic. I love that. The fact that your your archetype is going to take what you're already really good at mm-hmm. and make it better in a f- in whatever particular flavor you want to make it better in, super fucking cool. Um, but with spellcasters, what we've been seeing is they're very intrinsically tied to the archetype. The archetype not only adds the flavor, but gives them a very unique path to follow. And as Tanner has pointed out, um, you know, feats from outside of the class are going to change that flavor even more. Uh, the way you decide to 
to buy whatever feats you're going to buy into whatever feats you're going to buy into is going to change how your uh, druid of, of the Circle of the Veil is going to play compared to my druid of the Circle of the Veil. They, they both get the same things as druids of Circle of the Veil, but whatever bonus feats and shit we pick, our ancestries, everything else, that's going to massively change how those characters play. Um... And so my prediction is the more casting classes we see, I think the more their archetypes are going to be intrinsically tied to them. And I actually like this separation between martial and casting. Martial is good even at the core of their abilities, and their archetypes make their core abilities flourish. Casters are tied to their archetypes, which... which make the character flourish from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And I really like that idea. My prediction may be 1,000% wrong, and I'm always ready to be proven wrong on shit, because that means that I wasn't able to predict something, and I'm about to be surprised. And hopefully it's a pleasant one. Every surprise we've gotten so far has been a pleasant one. There have been two moments where I've said, what the fuck, in this, uh, in this current... Uh, Valley of the Judge series, that was not a, what the fuck is this? It's more like a, what the fuck? As in, amazed rather than disappointed. So Tanner, you make me anticipate and theory craft on something that already exists and I will see later. <laughs> Keep doing that. <laughs> now, with with that said, um, I think we, I, I do want to touch on the description given for the, um, for the for the archetypes, um, okay. it says a herald is always directed by the message they must they must further, the cause to which they devote themselves. This message and its origin are different for every herald and and shape the lives they lead and the tales they tell. So this is this is also intrinsic to how your character is going to be role played. Mm -hmm. At least, I I know we haven't seen any any rules regarding uh deficits for role playing poorly and i hope we don't see any rules like that like the rules that are supposed to uh, in in older versions of dnd force an alignment change if you role play the wrong way i always thought that those were dumb um of course we've always thought that the alignment grid is dumb in general <clears throat> um but i i can i can see a situation where uh you could make an interesting conundrum for a herald where they have to choose between prudence and their message mm -hmm. and choosing their message can lead to a lot of heartache for the party on one on one hand on one hand i see where you're coming from on the other hand that leans a little bit too close to lawful stupid for my liking i know i know and but in this in this way you don't have to say the heartache is they're they're so strictly tied to their message that they have to tell it no matter what. But you would make it a, a matter of degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, choosing prudence, choosing not to not to be as vocal about your message for the sake of of uh, convenience and not rocking a boat in a situation where rocking the boat could be less than desirable could give you an easier time to access story, get you some other stuff from other places within that. Whereas rocking the boat, if you succeed, and hell, even if you fail in some cases, may lead to an entirely different path with different resources and different rewards. That, at, that, at that point, though, you're, you're, you're counting more on the GM to be able to GM well enough rather than the character to make that choice. Mm -hmm. um, there are going to be people who play their heralds as lawful stupid, especially since the name herald makes you think of a guy with a banner on the back of a horse. Um, or worse, the um, town crier. Hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that would be worse. But in the end, I think that... This being, this being used more as a prompt than as a a steadfast rule. And like I said, I really don't want to see steadfast role-playing rules that give really restrictive deficits for role-playing uh, against certain facets of your character. Um, and I don't think we will. But, you know, just saying. 
I, don't, I hope we don't see that. And I will point it out if we do. And I'll be a little sad. I will be sad, Tanner, if that's the case. But I hope it isn't. Um, <laughs> but uh, this this could be seen more as inspiring for whoever's making the character. They read the Herald class because they don't know what class they're going to play. They read this message about their archetypes. Like, I have an idea for a character who's motivated by this really, this axiom or this 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 idea and that could fit into this archetype thing let's do it mm -hmm. so again really happy to see this sort of stuff now with that with that said we'll start with the message of valor who is basically going to be our 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 um our battlefield herald um like i said the guy on the horse with a banner in hand mm -hmm. <laughs> Why am I thinking of Hildegard von Krohn? I can't imagine why. Anyways, or, or maybe, or maybe you're thinking of a uh, thin uh, Kiesk. I, yeah, I can, I can go with, I can go with that, I can go with that as well. It's not, it's not as, it's not as good. It's not because of the flag. It's because of the motif. Oh, I know. He's a, he, he, I would say he's a bad herald, but he's still the whole banner on the battlefield thing. He's um. I went with I went with Hildegard because that seemed because that's where my mind goes to with this with that whole um with that whole battlefield leader archetype. Sin mm -hmm. is a little young to be a leader, and there's also, I mean com there's also the fact that he's raised by he that he was taught by <laughs> raised Saul. by Fred. Yeah. Who who um who certainly taught him how to survive, but not a whole lot else. Yeah. Um and also compared to compared to Fred, uh Yes, I call Soul Bad Guy Fred to get under every guilty gear player's skin here. Um <clears throat> mostly because a lot of the, probably because a lot of them don't get don't get the reference. <laughs> It says rock you on his it says rock you on his <sighs> it says rock you on his on his on his headband yes i just <sighs> i am surprised and just i'm not going to go too much into this because rails but i'm but i am very disappointed in the fact that a lar that a large sw a large swath of the of the of the Guilty Gear community is very unaware of how, of how intrinsically tied um, to the history of metal um, Guilty Gear is. We are the champions, my friend. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so at first level, Heralds of Valor gain gain bonus proficiencies. They gain martial proficiency in a weapon subcategory of your choice. With which you already have simple proficiency and may choose from one of the following options: you get either you can get proficiency in either strength defense, standard shields, and heavy armor, dexterity defense, light shields, and martial proficiency in an additional weapon subcategory, which of of your choice with which you already have simple proficiency, and you gain proficiency in your or you gain proficiency in your constitution defense, standard shields. And medium armor. Um, that's rather interesting. Um, it, it it does gear this caster up to have a much more martial side to them, mm -hmm. especially since that bonus proficiencies area at higher levels takes the bonus feat feature from the core of the class and says, rather than a general feat. Um, at 5th, 11th, and 17th levels, you can choose to gain a martial feat instead. That's... He did say that he didn't do multi-classing the normal way because it's all using different features, but... This is a literal, like, this is in your face about it. Of, hey, yeah, you're, you're a herald with a message of valor, right? Well, here... You get martial proficiency in at least one weapon you already have simple proficiency in. And you can either be proficient in strength, dex, or con defense. Uh, 
standard or light shields, depending on which package you're choosing, and a heavy or medium armor, depending on which package you're choosing. Or if you choose the dex package, another weapon to be martial proficient in. That's a... Wow. That's just like, here, have a martial package on top of your caster. So guys, um, maybe Herald Message of Valor is a good way to be a spell sword. Well, it'll certainly be a, be a better way to be a blade singer than being a subtype of wizard. <laughs> no, I'm not salty. Stop asking. <laughs> Monk. Monk, the accident was five years ago. It's not your fault. <sighs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> let's see, with you also get you also get a modifier to combat inspiration, or rather, inspiration die becomes combat inspiration. When an ally has an inspiration die and hits from you and hits with an attack, they may roll your inspiration die and add the number rolled to the damage roll. An ally can only damage a single creature in this way. If their attack would hit multiple creatures, they may select which creature takes the additional damage. This damage is of the same type as the initial attack. On a critical hit, the ally may double the damage dice gained from this feature. So with that group thing, I'm think I have this image of give of giving it to a wizard and the who's casting fireball who and spends it on saying, "Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you," and double fuck that motherfucker over there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. At sixth level, you gain. The Din of Battle. When a creature uses an inspiration from you to prevent damage that would be dealt to it, it may add your intuition modifier to the to the roll of the inspiration die. Also, when a creature uses an inspiration die from you to add additional damage to its attack, your intuition modifier is considered the minimum roll on the die. <laughs> Whenever you give an ally an inspiration die, you also gain an inspiration die, which you would use in the same way a normal ally would. So, when it says your intuition mod is the minimum roll on the die, does that mean that it's the minimum roll? Because because this this would only be good if you have an an intuition mod of plus five or greater. If your minimum roll is if the if the intuition mod is four or less, that's an auto fail on rolls. Remember. Um, so I'm not. Maybe I'm interpreting that wrong. That see. I would definitely like clarification on. Let, um. I. No, it's when 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 it's. I think I think the I think the minimum I think the way it's working here is um is ba is basically the br is basically the brutal rule without the um without rerolls. The way I th what I think isn't what I think is intended is that the intuition modifier is treated as the minimum roll on that inspiration die. So if you Okay, get, so okay, if okay. A, if it's a D6 inspiration die and and they end up using that die for for to add additional damage. Yeah, and you're in yeah, I miss. Modifiers. I definitely misread that. It is something worth it is something worth clarifying. And of course, whenever you give an ally an inspiration die, die you also gain an inspiration die, which you would use in the same same way a normal ally would. I'm sensing a pattern here. Anyway, um, at tenth level, you gain call to valor. While threatened, you may utilize a, a 10 foot quick action and expend a vitality in order to bolster or fortify creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you. They gain a severity of the condition equal to your intuition modifier until the threat subsides. Creatures cannot be may not be bolstered or fortified by this feature more than once during an encounter unless all severity of the conditions have been removed from them. Alternatively, you may utilize a 10-foot quick action and expend a vitality in order to cause creatures of your choice within 15 feet of you to each gain one hit point and recover any missing willpower. Ooh. One HP and recover all uh, any any missing willpower. 
That means back to their willpower maximum. Mm-hmm. That's that's fantastic. Okay. Uh, so, as for the fortified or bolstered um, conditions, fortified, a creature uh, cannot be both vulnerable and fortified. Instead, if the two conditions would affect the same creature, the lower severity is subtracted from the higher. For each severity of the fortified condition affecting a creature, it gains one additional point of damage reduction. A creature may not be fortified beyond its fortitude score. And then bolstered. uh, A creature cannot be both bolstered and weakened. Instead of the two conditions would affect the same creature, the lower severity is subtracted from the higher. At the beginning of a creature's turn, it may choose to gain the benefits of one of the following effects until the beginning of its next turn, or 10 seconds if initiative is not being tracked. Its physical defenses increase by one for each severity of the bolstered condition on it. It does one additional damage with attacks that would deal damage to each severity of the bolster that would deal damage for each severity of the bolstered condition on it. A creature loses one severity of the condition each round that is that it is not threatened. And uh, bolstered is limited by focus because he said accidentally said fortitude earlier. Yeah, uh, um, so being fortified just gives you DR, which is flat good. Mm-hmm. Um, and being bolstered gives you the ability to choose for a turn either to increase all defenses by one, all physical defenses by one for each severity of the condition, or do one additional damage with attacks for each severity of the condition. So if you bolster someone and you have an int mod of five, that's either five additional physical defenses at the beginning of their turn, or five additional damage with all attacks that deal damage for their turn. And it goes down to four the next turn if they're not threatened. Mm -hmm. If they're still threatened, it remains at five. And That's insane. Oh, yeah. Let's see. At 14th level, you get Get Up. When you use Call to Valor to cause creatures of your choice within 15 feet of you to gain one hit point, you may expend an additional vitality to heal them. For each creature, you may expend one vitality in order to roll your Inspiration die, add your Intuition and Proficiency modifier, and have that creature regain that many hit points. In addition, until the end of your next turn, each affected ally gains additional damage reduction equal to your intuition modifier. And now we see why the uh, vitality gain during pushing forward is uh, so important. (laughs) I'm going to spend some vitality to make all you motherfuckers stand the fuck back up. I like the the flavor text here, too. You're not dead, and I won't have you fighting like you are. (laughs) That sounds like something you and I would say. Oh, yeah. Um, and at 18th level as the capstone, you, ga- you gain Paragon of Valor. Each time you gain an inspiration from either Den of Battle or another Herald, all allies within 15 feet of you gain an inspiration die as well. And your vitality increases by 4. Oh, good. We've got, we've got another chain going. <laughs> yep. Yep, and he got, and he got, you know, we we already see that, you know, at, at with with assuming twenty intuition and, and at level at level twenty you would have fifteen vitality. At eighteenth level, you still got thir- well eighteen divided by nine plus five, so you got fourteen. You got fourteen uh, of your uh, of your vitality plus five makes that 19 plus you know whatever you might have gotten from other features maybe some martial features there are some martial features that i could that that, that if they mimic some things i saw over in barbarian could give you some additional vitality um or you know whatever features you might get from your your ancestry Mm. uh that could that could work too you're gonna you're gonna have a, a pool of vitality with which to make people get the hell up in battle, and then of course Din of Battle is gonna give you more inspiration and give everyone else inspiration too. Remember how we were des- thinking we should design a, 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 a party of eight, um, of of eight 
eight fighters of weapon ma- of, of the weapon master archetype so they could just give each other the stances uh over and over again yeah two uh take that party through <laughs> through uh throw two message of valor uh heralds in there did a battle <laughs> they're constantly cheating off each other <laughs> Uh, I am a. Uh... And the thing by is, the time looks... I'm done with this, I'm going to create the Fellowship of the Ring in this game. Except <laughs> it's going to be better than than Tolkien's Fellowship. I mean, I've already created Druid Gimli. Mm-hmm. Um. Wait, a, a a better a better Fellowship of the Ring. Um, or, <laughs> or rather, what? One that one that actually one that actually sticks one that actually sticks around the whole way through, because you never split the party. Wouldn't yeah? That ju- wouldn't that just um? Wouldn't we just wouldn't that just be um the seven samurai with extra steps? But unlike the extra steps in most cases, which are pointless, this is extra steps that are fun. I was gonna I was gonna say either that or every every um every playable cat. Every playable cast in um, a Suicode endgame. <laughs> Don't you mean Chrono Cross, Monk? Chrono Cross only had only had around forty. That was Suikoden, sixty. No, four, forty or sixty. Suicoden has one hundred and eight. Well, yes, but that's because one hundred and eight is the number in mythology dealing with that particular Wuxia series. <clears throat> yeah, which which means in a case like this, um, more more chaining. We're just gonna have everybody group up in the largest, in the lar- in the in the most tight knit group that they can, um, because that many people is gonna take up a lot of five foot squares, um, and we're gonna place people in nodes so that all of their auras of sharing stuff overlap, but just barely. So, in other words, we've just made the most competent raid ever. Especially if we have a little, a, a couple of of the. Uh, of the commander type fighters having everybody move forward in formation lockstep. <laughs> Congratulations, we've actually we've actually made a raid that could prob that could probably that could probably survive um the extreme version of Coils of Bahamut. What about unending coils of Bahamut? <laughs> Let's not get crazy. Also I believe I believe you got that a little bit wrong. It's the savage coils. Um, those types of raids are savage. Yeah, I know, tri- I know. trials go extreme. Yeah, um, oh, extreme trials, also known as bullshit. Extreme Leviathan wasn't that bad. I only watched people get washed off every five minutes. I um, I still <laughs> I'm, I never rec- I never recovered from um from extreme Titan. <laughs> you don't have lag but you still get pushed off the cliff because fuck you that's why yeah but um and anyway the next one we have is mess is message of beauty <laughs> a herald tasked to deliver the message of beauty can often be found by often can found consulting nobility reveling in the beauty of nature or even sometimes honing their craft in finer establishments a herald tasked with this message does their best to find beauty in all things and to make themselves and those around them truly beautiful. Because it is difficult to avoid their charm, they are often utilized by nobility as diplomats, negotiators, and even courtesans. So is this going to fall under the curse of the diplomancer that fucks dragons? Let's find out. Oh boy. So first we have the bon- we have bonus proficiencies. You gain proficiency in your dexterity defense. If you do not have proficiency in the persuasion skill, you gain proficiency and tier 1 expertise in that skill. If you already have proficiency in that skill, you gain 2 tiers of expertise instead. You learn the enthrall spell. It does not count against the number of spells you know. Then then we have... And I... The whole idea... I can, 
it's not as it's not as varied as the as the bonus proficiencies from College of Valor, but it is definitely interesting. Message of Valor. Message These of are not Valor. Bardic colleges. Colleges. Yeah, I'm, These go are I'm gonna be making messages. I'm gonna be making that mistake a lot, and I apologize because old habits die hard. I know, and I'm going to be here to uh, helpfully correct you every time. So, after that, we have the Muse's Favor. Whenever an ally makes an attack roll or an ability check and has an unspent inspiration die, they may add plus one to that roll. In addition, an ally with an unspent inspiration die from you gains plus one to each of its defenses. Inspiration gained from multiple Heralds of Beauty do not stack for the purposes of this feature. Aww. No, he had to think ahead to 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 making it to. He's he's already learning from a uh, from our uh, our stance sharing. <laughs> he he has to make sure things can't stack too much, or you just go op. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, we're seeing uh benefits for not spending your die. They're, they're making the die. Um, useful even when you're not spending it so again as you you don't fall into the rainy day paradox like you said mm -hmm. um, and this is actually a really good one unspent inspiration you just get plus one to your rolls for attack attacker ability checks mm -hmm. also all your defenses just get plus one there you go yeah. while plus one may not seem like a lot um I dare you to go roll a d20 and tell me that plus one didn't make a fucking difference. That's still 5%. So, <laughs> on, the other, on the other end of thing, you have the Muse's Disfavor. You may give an inspiration die to an enemy rather than an ally. If you do, that enemy may not use the inspiration die and instead receives minus one to its attacks and ability checks. On its turn, a creature can use its action to overcome your disfavor and remove all inspiration placed on it by you. This... Being able to spend inspiration on enemies is a fucking game changer. There's also the fact that it, that this kind of thing is a very good stalling tactic. Or, if you know who's next up in the initiative list if you're using an initiative list mm -hmm. for uh for you you could cast it on an enemy that's close to an ally and then af after the next enemy's turn and that ally's turn come up they now have minus one to anything that ally wants to do to torment the fuck out of them mm -hmm. up to and including killing the shit out of them <laughs> and again because of the fact that they'd have to use their action to get rid to get rid of it um, that's why I said that's why I said a stalling tactic. Mm -hmm. If there's only one enemy you have to deal you have to deal with, you could just keep putting on you just keep putting it on them and keep pissing them off until you run out of vitality to place a mm -hmm. place inspiration dice. But that's probably not going to happen in an encounter. Probably could yeah. still. Now after that is irresistible. A creature may have multiple inspiration die from either the Muse's Favor or the Muse's Disfavor feature. A creature may have up to three inspiration die from either feature at any one time. The bonuses granted from the Muse's Favor stack with this feature, as do the penalties applied by the Muse's Disfavor. Ooh. Stacking inspiration dice. That was hinted all the way back at the beginning. That a creature can't hold more than one inspiration die except if a feature says so. And I present to you a feature saying so. Now, <laughs> this means that you can give allies up to three uh, three inspiration dice at that point. So that's, um... And at sixth level, wouldn't you have the first changeover? Yeah, you, that would be D8 instead of D, instead of D6 at that point. Um, I can see that snowballing. There, there isn't, there is no way any. Uh, this isn't going to get overpowered quickly, not at all. Mm -hmm. So after that, at tenth level, you gain counter charm. 
An ally with an inspiration die on it from you is immune to the compelled condition unless the severity of that condition would surpass 4 plus your intuition modifier. And whenever you place an inspiration die on an enemy, you may place 2 rather than 1, still only requiring 1 vitality. So you can place 2 at once and spend only 1 vitality to do so. And then they'd have to spend 2 turns to get rid of both dice. Mm. That's... <laughs> <laughs> that uh that snooty elf I, I voiced earlier seems like she's actually more competent than she is so and in addition you gain effortless grace you may grant an inspiration die as a quick as a zero foot quick action rather than a 10 foot one mm, tasty so you can still you can still you still get full movement when you grant when you grant inspiration die. Mm-hmm. So next is Curse of Hesitance. Any creature that has an inspiration die from you has disadvantage on attack rolls against you that target your physical defenses and any enemy that attacks you an enemy that attacks you receives an inspiration die from your disfavor ability, requiring neither action nor vitality. A creature may still only have three inspiration die from you at any given time. So, things that have an uh, inspiration die have disadvantage on attack rolls that target physical defense. And then any enemy that attacks you automatically gets a disfavor inspiration die. What?! This is one of those moments of what the fuck? <laughs> oh, you're gonna attack me? Okay, the muses hate you now. What? Come on, keep attacking. I fucking dare you. Let's see how let's see how low you can go. <laughs> gonna spend more turns attacking me? Oh, here's some more dice, bitch. Yep. <laughs> I love it. That's great. So a after that is the capstone, Blessing of the Muse. While threatened, whenever a creature within 60 feet of you that can hear you rolls eight rolls a 20 on an, on an attack roll or a 1 on an attack, you may grant it one un inspiration die without expending resources. Whenever you grant an ally an inspiration, you may grant another ally within 30 feet of them inspiration as, w as well, requiring neither action nor vitality, and your vitality increases by 4. Huh. Imagine that. Small increases to your vitality pull for, for, for the first two capstones we've seen. Mm -hmm. Will this be a pattern? Find out soon. However, hey, if you roll a crit fail or a crit fumble, I could give you an inspiration die without using any quick actions or vitality. So, uh, so the enemy crit fumbles. Here, have a disfavor die. Mm -hmm. And they have to be within 60 feet of you, but if you're in battle, most things are usually within 60 feet of you. It's very rare that you're, that you're not within that range, um, just due to the nature of how the grid combat is, is worked in 5e. Um, and since this did have its skeleton from 5e, uh, that's still going to be there. Um, and then, of course, uh, grant an ally inspiration, grant another ally within 30 feet of them inspiration. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that only goes once. Um, you can't just grant and then grant again and then grant again and then grant again and then grant again. I'm pretty sure it's only once. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't going to be a case where we have Khaled going another one. Yeah. The, the, I, I would, I would, I would say, rather than grant another ally, grant one other ally. Mm -hmm. That way, it's 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 known it's limited to one other ally as clarification. Unless, unless I'm completely wrong and Tanner does want it to chain like a stack of dominoes. <laughs> I think though, I I, if that was if that was the case, I think it would be classified under accidental genius. Yeah, we've given him a lot of that. We should start charging. Um, 
<laughs> I'm kidding, Tanner. <laughs> but uh, the fact that it doesn't cost any resources, what this does mean is that while you can't go inspire ally, inspire the next ally, inspire the next ally, inspire the next ally for free, you can go ally roll to 20, inspire that ally. Oh, there's someone next to them, insp inspire that guy too. All of it for free. By the way, you have the Muse's favor now. Enjoy that extra defense and the extra rolls. <laughs> the extra the extra plus one to your rolls and your defenses. <laughs> I uh I'm having far too much fun with this. Yes, you are. Can you blame me, monk? No. This is glorious. Oh. Next is message of lore. A, her a herald asked to deliver the message of lore seeks to learn more about all things, and they have a vast array of knowledge about history and are asked and are tasked not only to record it but to create it as well. Um, ah, so they aren't they aren't shitty uh, non-combative observers. They're instead uh, fantastic uh, combative combative history makers. Yay! So none, none of that, none of that. We have to record what ha we have to record what happened, but we can't interfere. Mm-hmm. So in other words, fuck you, Prime Directive. Which was ignored at their convenience whenever they wanted because Gene Roddenberry's a hack. <laughs> yeah. I, did I say that out loud? I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> <sighs> Starfleet is not a military, my ass. No, I'm never letting that go. <laughs> anyway, so we start with bonus proficiencies. You gain proficiency in your wits defense. If you are not profic if you are not if you don't have proficiency in the history skill, you gain it and tier one expertise in that skill. If you already have proficiency in that skill, you gain two tiers of expertise. And you learn a spell of your choice for free. Yeah, this isn't just you get enthrall. This is any spell of your choice that you that you haven't uh, that you haven't already chosen with your spell casting uh, list. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. That's nice. That makes right. me happy. Let's see, ah, you also gain inspired knowledge. When you give an ally an inspiration die, you may also choose a skill or ability defense with which they are not proficient. While they have the Inspiration die, they have proficiency in that skill or ability defense. If they use the Inspiration die to grant a bonus to the chosen skill or ability defense, they gain both the proficiency bonus and the roll of the Inspiration die. I think I got an idea on how, on how the message of lore is going to be working. Wait, wait, let, let me read that just one more time. I want to I wanna, I wanna soak that in. Go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I see it. I see it. I'm going to give you proficiency in this skill or ability defense. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to use the inspiration die for that skill or ability defense. Okay, you get a proficiency bonus and the roll of the die for that one roll. That's, um... That's nice that spending the die doesn't get rid of the proficiency bonus before you use it for that skill. That's very nice. And because okay. of the fact that they, because of the be, while they do have a, while they do have a, it's one of the. I feel like this is one of those things that could, be that could be easily used to help um co to help cover the less help help cover the less skilled. Yeah. Because you know there you know there's been that player who panics because they don't have that one skill. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Like I can't, I can't help you out with that. I'm not proficient. You are now. <laughs> so, Don't worry, I can teach you how to bake at least today. So the next is, um, next is faded events at sixth level. I like, um, I like the, I like the uh, tagline here. Let things fall as they should, as they were faded to do. Any ally with an inspiration die from you can expend the die and remake any roll they have just made, rather than adding the inspiration die to that roll. 
You may apply an Inspiration die to an enemy as well as an ally. If you do, that enemy may not use the Inspiration die, and instead you may expend that Inspiration die and... and I'm not sure why there's that, a... In, yeah, in order I know. To for, in order to force that creature to remake any roll it has just made, this feature does not require you to utilize your reaction. This is a fuck you button. This is, um... At least what when was you the do it to the enemy. This is the name of the... Uh, what was the name of that one feat that allowed you to re-roll dice in base fifth? Lucky, I think it was called, or something? Something like that. This is that, except you can inflict it on people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's basically... A, it's a do... It's a do-over slash fuck you button. I like the fuck you button idea. Mm -hmm. Hey, guy! Yeah? You. You will miss. Trust me. What? Later on, misses. What the fuck? <laughs> it, 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 wait, no! I've got it! I've got a better... I've got a better reference, Funk. What do you... <clears throat> Next, you will say, you were only pretending to be retarded. I was only pretended to be... What? <laughs> it's young Joseph Joestar. Yeah, I can't... Uh, I, I can't disagree. Prediction so, of action. So, next is the knowledge of experience. You gain... And I think I and I think we just clear. I think we just confirmed that Harbinger was what what it w was supposed to be originally because of um, the flavor text here. Yeah. So might want to replace that with Messenger. Well. Or Herald. Mm -hmm. And you gain proficiency in two skills or artistries. Alternatively, you may gain proficiency in one skill or and one and artistry. one artistry. Holy shit. Yeah, this is this is going how I'd get how I guessed. Um at 14th level, you gain inspi inspired insp inspired instruction. Whenever you give an inspiration die to an ally, you may choose to give them proficiency in two skills or defenses, or one skill and one defense in which they are not proficient, rather than just one. Hey you, guy over there who's having a lot of trouble with this person we're fighting because your magic defenses are shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, you have proficiency in two of the magical defenses. What? Yeah, there you go. Stop sucking. <laughs> and there's their um capstone at 18th is sealed fates whenever an ally uses an inspiration die t from you to re-roll a roll that inspiration if that that inspiration die is not expended if they fail the roll they may not use the inspiration die to remake the roll on the same attempt good good sa good save there Whenever you force an enemy with an inspiration die to remake a roll, that inspiration die is not expended if they succeed the roll. You may not use the inspiration die to force them to remake the roll on the same on the same attempt. So basically, I've put an inspiration die on you, and until your re-roll is either successful if you're an ally or a failure if you're an enemy, that die sticks to you like glue. Mm -hmm. Also, can I uh, can I just can I just say that as soon as we read the name of this feature, there was only one thing stuck in my mind. Ba 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 da 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 da. Yes, the battle of, the battle of the fates. <laughs> I feel like I encouraged. I feel like I encouraged this with bringing up the high ground keg. <laughs> You did, but you also have to. You also have to remember. I would have. Uh, I would have thought of this anyway. And of course, and of course, last but not least, your vitality increases by four. Huh? I'm seeing a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> Can you see a pattern, children? Do we have to ask Blue to help us see the pattern? What? <laughs> Uh, 
Let's not and say we did. Oh, no fun. Anyway, next is the message of music. To you, music is more than a soothing melody, a joyful refrain, or a mournful dirge. With song and splendor, your music fuses with your message and shapes the world around it. So this. So is here we. So here we actually have the people who double down on the whole instrument thing. Which, I mean, giving it its own path is still a cool idea. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> For bonus proficiencies, oh God. you gain proficiency in your resolve defense, and you learn the madness spell for free. <laughs> oh, oh God, that has some terrible implications, given that we're talking about music. Wait a minute, is uh, is this is this a Malkavian, or is? <laughs> You have you are let you are some of you may be familiar with the meme of the world's worst orchestra. <laughs> and specifically their rendition of the overture from two thousand one A Space Odyssey. I like the recorder version of that overture. <laughs> Remember everyone, the recorder version is always superior even when it's shite. There was a there was a small part of me that that wished for an April Fool's joke that was played as the as the entrance music for Ric Flair. I can see it. Ric Flair would do it if he was if he wanted to. Yeah. Um, you also gain rhythmic concentration. An ally with an unspent inspiration die from you increases their willpower by one. This bonus willpower cannot be used to activate features which require the expenditure of willpower. So it's a bit of a um, safety net. Yeah. Let's see. At 6th level, you gain Dissonant Chord. You may give an Inspiration Die to an enemy rather than an ally. If you do, that enemy may not use the Inspiration Die. For each Inspiration Die from you, the enemy gains 3 Severity of the Distracted Hidden Condition. An enemy may not exceed 6 Severity of the Distracted Hidden Condition from this feature. On its turn, that enemy may use its action to purge itself of all inspiration dice placed on it by you. So, hailing back to our conditions, um, let me see here. Distracted. So the hidden condition was... Because the hidden condition affects other creatures' abilities to perceive things, events that would distract also utilize the hidden condition. A creature's perception is afflicted because it is distracted by something. Some mechanics will say they impose the distracted condition rather than the hidden condition. In this case, everything except that which is distracting the creature is considered to be hidden from it. So rather than being hidden distracted, which means you're hidden because other people are distracted, something being distracted hidden means they are distracted and everything is hidden from them why do i get the why do i get the vibe of the where'd everybody go gag or the um pulp fiction john travolta nobody's there when he shows up gag mm -hmm. and anyway at 10th level you gain sound in silence Hello, darkness, Hello, darkness my, my old friend. friend. <laughs> we had the same idea, Monk. Probably because it was terrible. Or great. Remember, great minds think alike. Anyways, creatures no longer need to hear or see you to receive the bonuses or penalties from your inspiration die. Holy shit! I mentioned earlier that the whole being, you know... Something being able to hear you thing was it was a limitation if you were suddenly stuck in a magical silence. I'm a fucking genius. I pointed out something that became part of a defining feature in a later archetype. Mm -hmm. As long as an ally within 30 feet of you has an inspiration die from you, you can add an additional secondary effect to your spells without spending spell points. 
Secondary effects from this feature still count against your secondary effect limit. Okay, so you can get even more secondary effects without spending spell points. It just counts against your limit. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Oh, yes. So I'm just going to cast my madness spell with all of the secondary effects. Mm -hmm. Then we have Focusing Chord at 14th level. Whenever you place an inspiration on an, another creature, you may grant one to yourself as as well, though you may only ever have one inspiration from this feature. No chaining for you. Yep, you can't chain it from another another message of music. Mm -hmm. And lastly, lastly at 18th level is Power Chord. With the description of a great and grand finale. You may utilize a, t a 20 foot quick action, that's quite an ask, and expend an inspiration on, your s on yourself to give an inspiration die to all other creatures within 30 feet of you without expending additional vitality, and your vitality increases by 4. Again, we see the pattern continue, but this means focusing cord is meant directly to a, inspire, a, 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 a chain into power cord. Mm -hmm. They're both named cord for a reason. Basically, you're playing your chords, you're jamming on the guitar, everybody's feeling it, you're feeling it, and then you play the power chord, and everybody's like, yeah! <laughs> it's metal! Yeah. Yeah, it is. Fucking metal as fuck is what this is. Oh. And last your her your heralds of your your heralds of music are metal are, are metal bands. That's I I actually are the mess the message of music herald is Eddie Riggs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but we don't have Jack Black on hand to say decapitation. No. Nor do we have Tim Curry to kill. Nope. Lastly, the message of doom. Doom, 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 doom. Thank you, Gur. The world and those in it are doomed to face cataclysmic peril. You and you alone have been tasked to inform them of this. A herald bring bearing the message of doom has been tasked with foretelling the end of an era or even the world and is compelled to bring that message to the ears of those who, who might stave off its destruction. Okay, okay then. So, I was tempted to make the black pill joke, but no, that's too easy. <laughs> you are a flagellant. You are. I'm gonna. <laughs> go I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go further. I'm gonna go further. You're the panhandler with the uh, with the sign on, on the freeway entrance. <laughs> oh. The world is ending, so buy me a beer. Mm -hmm. I was tempted to also say you are um, the doors. <laughs> <sighs> God damn it, monk. Or that mental breakdown scene in Apocalypse Now. Again, god damn it, monk. Any anyway. So for bonus proficiencies, you gain a proficiency in your constitution defense. If you do not have proficiency in the investigation skill, you gain it and tier one expertise in that skill. If you already have proficiency, you gain two tiers of expertise. And you learn the wither spell. But given the flavor text, whose voices are those? Are they yours or another's? I feel like this is leaning Malkavian. Probably. That's music, uh, music sounds more, um... No, I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> oh. Then we have... You also gain Cursed Existence. You may give an inspiration die to an enemy rather than an ally. Oh, you're, we're getting this early. If you do, that enemy may not use the inspiration die, though it may use its action to remove any inspiration die you have placed upon it. In addition, you may place more than one inspiration die on an enemy up to a number of two. 
An enemy gains one severity of the vulnerable condition for each inspiration die you have placed upon it. As a reminder, the vulnerable condition is one of those ones that I thought was actually really fucking powerful. Because the vulnerable condition... For each severity of the vulnerable condition on a creature, the threat range for attacks against it increases by one. <sighs> for each severity of the condition, which I think that that actually needs to. Uh, there's some there there are some suggestions I'll make on this document in a second. If the severity of this condition surpasses a creature's fortitude score, attacks against that creature's physical defenses have advantage. If the severity of this condition surpasses a creature's focus score, attacks against that creature's mental defenses have advantage. So, vulnerable, the reason I said that uh, vulnerable seemed so powerful was not only because you're increasing the critical threat range against that creature. Um, if the severity is high enough, there's advantage to the types of attacks you're using. So, yeah, I like Cursed Existence. That's nice. Let's see. At 6th level, you gain Plague of Fear. Whenever you place the weakened or vulnerable condition on a creature, you may also compel it. The severity of the condition is equal to the total severity of the weakened and vulnerable conditions you placed on, you placed on it. You may, only, you may only command an enemy that is compelled from this feature to flee from you. Um, if I remember correctly, we were talking about compelled one time before, and it was... Yeah, so uh, in, in a pre... In, uh, in the Barbarian, we saw enthralled, and that was supposed to be compelled. So... Um... As for what compelled does, I mean, it's probably pretty pretty obvious. Um, the effects of compel only exist only between the compelled target and the creature which inflicted the condition. For each severity of the compelled condition on a creature, the creature which inflicted the condition receives a plus one bonus on any ability check to convince the compelled target of something. If the severity of the compelled condition ex exceeds a creature's focus... The compeller can compel the creature to act in a way contrary to its nature for the duration of 10 seconds, or one round if initiative is being tracked. When the compeller does so, the severity of the compelled condition is reduced on the compelled creature by an amount equal to that creature's focus. When a creature is compelled in this way, that creature can choose to ignore the effect by taking 1d6 psychic damage for each severity of the compelled condition on it. If the severity of the compelled condition exceeds a creature's focus... The compelled creature takes 1d8 psychic damage for each severity of the compelled condition on it each time it attacks or otherwise attempts to harm the compeller. So, basically, once you've inflicted them with vulnerable, they they also can be inflicted with com uh, compelled, and you can make them do stuff. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So, after... after... After that, at 10th level, you gain Maddening Visage. Creatures that have disadvantage on ability investigation checks rolled to read your emotions and, dis and divination-based spells or other effects that would try to read your mind are made with disadvantage. Whenever you make an attack on another creature and your attack is critical or deflected, you may place one of your inspiration dice on it. <laughs> here have an inspiration die now got a got a good question here is this going to be like those other effects where you can place the inspiration dice without any um without spending vitality or is this one going to require vitality i would like that that uh clarification because we have had it in previous descriptions on archetypes At, 14, at 14th level, an enemy affected by your inspiration die loses any resistances or immunities it may have to the weakened or vulnerable conditions. And you may choose to have your Plague of Fear confuse creatures rather than compel him. <laughs> really? Confusion, where are you? 
Uh, oh yeah, it's the one where they have to roll dice uh, to see what they do. And, and but it, it's a uh, it's. If a creature is afflicted by the confused condition, it must roll a d10 at the beginning of its turn. If it rolls a number above the severity of the condition, it may move and act normally. If it rolls a number equal to or below the severity of the condition afflicting it, it is afflicted by the effect corresponding to the number it rolled on the d10. Although, given given the fact that... Um, that the 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 vulnerable the vulnerable that you can get up to that point is two two out of ten is eight is is low but um that's a that's just that's a twenty percent chance that they won't be able to act normally so essentially one in five yep um and if they roll a one or a two um they make one attack against a random creature within their reach. And the capstone is Eve of the Apocalypse. Whenever you inflict a creature, whenever you afflict a creature with the compelled condition, you may afflict any enemy within thirty feet of that creature with an inspiration die, without spending a vitality to do so. Only one inspiration die may be applied to a creature in this way, in the case of spells which af which affect multiple creatures or an area, and your vitality increases by four. They kind of held off on the on the free inspiration compared to some of the other ones, but the way that it's done seem I'd say makes up for that. Yeah. Um this is this last one message of doom. Um well, certainly interesting. I would say it feels a little lost. Which may be apropos considering what it is, but in, ter um, in terms, of, in terms of, in terms of its focus being a bit too wide, or what do you mean? Scaling, it it doesn't scale well. Yeah, I get, I get the feeling, I can, I get the feeling. Message of Doom is the most recent edition. Yeah, and uh, I, as you pointed out, too severity of a condition is, uh, especially at these high levels of fourteenth mm -hmm. and eighteenth level is very, very low. I'd say... Although, all, th all things considered, I think, I think one, of the one of the major things that sets this particular thing apart for, um, from the standard approach is the fact that the inspiration die with uh, with, a, with a bard, they're defined more by their casting ability than th than their um than their features, along with the fact that bar that bards seem to have see, bards in five e seem to have this whole good at good at a lot good at a lot of things and grandmaster and a few things kind of attitude. There's not as much. There's not. There's not as the bard taking us taking aside archetypes is not as um is not as skill monkey, but it it but it is it, it but each um. But I think that's the re that's part of why um, archetypes are gotten straight out of the gate is because once you pick an archetype, you're picking a specific field that you are going to be um, good at. Yeah. The, 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 the message of valor is very much going to be good at uh, at combat support. Yep. The me the message of beauty, I'd say, is going to be your buffer and debuffer. Buffer and debuffer, and of course, like I said, the diplomancer that fucks dragons. Mm -hmm. um, Especially since they have the enthrall magic. Yeah. Um, the message. The message of lore is for the uber skill monkey. Um, the message of lore is what the college of lore should have been in being. The skill monkey that also gets extra magic that's more versatile with that extra magic. Because it's one extra spell of any type mm -hmm. that you don't already own. This also means that um, 
it, with the exception of the message of valor uh while every herald gets four spells at maximum level every archetype but valor has five either the assigned ones for the for the three uh for the three archetypes of uh beauty music and and doom or the choose your own for lore um but the, I'd, the reason I say it's sk skill monkey is probably not the best term for lore. I'd say um, skill master would be. Yes, because it helps with with the proficiencies and mastery of of skills with other um, members of the party too, mm -hmm. and also weakens the skills of enemies. Now, when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to the message of music, we already we already made the joke about about it be about it basically being um basically being heavy metal. Um, brutal legend, y'all. Brutal legend. But there's oh, there's also the, there's also the fact that um I'd say I'd say that one it, that one leans a, leans a bit more into into de into the into the de into the debuffing, especially with especially with its six level feature. Yeah. Um... It, it it actually seems like the blaster caster of the group because of the tenth level feature. You get more secondary effects to to spend uh, because you're not expending spell points so long as people have inspiration die dice and are within thirty feet of you. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the, it's a it's a support blaster caster almost in my opinion. Yeah. Now obviously with obviously with a lot of these and of course the last one is the is the um. I mentioned the I mentioned the flagellant, but also the also the Malkavian can fit as well. Yeah, he is he's very much the CC. Mm -hmm. Vulnerable and com and compelled and confusion. Yeah, that that's CC. That's that's crowd control all the way. I would if I can, I would say when it comes to the message of doom, um, I think there needs to be a way to scale to scale it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it seems a little lost because it doesn't scale properly. But otherwise, the idea is fucking cool. Grant now, granted, a to a a twenty percent chance to have to have some to have them um act, act outside of what they wanted to is is nothing to sneeze at. But once you get into the teens, that is not enough. Especially when you consider some of the ridiculous abilities that have that have been covered in other um, subclasses. Yep. And the other th the other thing is that with a lot of with a lot of the um, with a lot of the su with a lot of the abilities covered in other subclasses, at some point there's some sort of chain or wi or wide area ab effect when it comes to inspiration. And I think they get it. I th they technically get it, but, but I'm it's not sure if they get it. But it's <laughs> yeah. But it's their capstone when a lot of people are getting it earlier. I'm not s I'm not saying scrap message of doom. I'm saying it's a little bit. It's a little bit nerfed. Yeah, there's there there's been some there's been an ethos behind the other uh, particular messages here that have been uh, there, there's a clear progression. You can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, it scales well, and it fits the theme, and just a little bit more tweaking to Message of Doom uh, to follow that ethos should should be considered. Um, but like I said. That's really that's really the only the only uh, criticism I have for Message of Doom is that the 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 features themselves seem a little bit lost and don't scale well. Uh, besides that, the 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 actual theme and the idea, fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Although to be honest, I I can't choose to I can't choose whether I would be Message of Valor or Message of Music in this one. Um, message of lore is cool. Message of beauty is cool. But I either want to be a rock and roll god, uh, or I just want to be that guy who tells everybody to get the fuck back up. We're fighting some more. Um. Oh wait, wait! I have the perfect character for for message of valor. 
Wake up, samurai. We have a city to burn. <laughs> Fuck you. Hey! Hey! The game is good. Fuck everybody else who says it isn't. It may not be living up to the hype, but nothing can live up to the hype of that fucking dev cycle. Eat shit. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm. I'm, saying I'm not that. talking to you. That I'm talking to them, monk. I know you. Um. In the but that that be that being said, when it when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the message of beauty, um, I keep. I, I, I tried. I want to. I think I should get some credit for the fact that I tried very, very hard to not lean into the bard as a sex god. But um, since you brought that up, the message of beauty is um, '80s Prince. <laughs> you started. I wanna it, not me. I want to. I want to make a worse joke. 70s Ron Jeremy. Mm, too easy. <laughs> too easy. And also, anybody who looks that up is going to go blind. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, also, Tanner, thank you for giving me the opportunity to completely uh, traumatize Monk by imitating a half-elven woman telling people that she's going to make them better because she's awesome. Fucking, fucking elves. Oh, no, 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 no. Only half-elf. So, you're half right. <laughs> Regardless, um... I really like, I really, really, really like this class. I think I really, some, I really think like it. That, I think something that really helps in this case is the is the fact that the that you can that you can utilize the um, support abilities offensively. Fantastic uh, idea! Yes, with a with a lot of bar with a lot of bard archetypes. Um, a, a lot of these, there's a case of do, there's a case of doing support, and doing def and doing defense. They're supposed to be a backliner. Mm hmm Whereas in this, they're very, except for Valor, who is very much a frontliner. Most of these are mid range. Mm hmm Um, I would say that the the ones that are especially mid range are the ones that inflict. Uh, inspiration dice in areas around themselves, so music and beauty. Um, and then ones that could be mid to back range are going to be Doom and Lore, because they can inflict dice from a distance and also in an area around enemies. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a lot of versatility depending on what type of herald you want to go for. Because, frankly, uh, these are all extremely viable. As we've seen with each class we've gone through thus far, um, the, the class does not close in on you. It doesn't make you feel like you're being funneled to a specific conclusion, which is an issue that we've seen in D&D &D, uh, constantly. It, it's, it's part of the pay not to suck uh, that we always deride because paying not to suck is again being funneled to a specific conclusion and it's also you know the the uh the fucking stupid system mastery insistence this um this i think something that we can really say here something that i that i have been seeing in the entire ethos of this project and i'm glad i see it here is this game encourages system exploration. Which you are because yeah, go ahead. because of that um I could see I could see this I could see um people wanting a lot a lot of times um a lot of times whenever whenever the question of multiple whenever the question of multiple characters come um per player comes up 
it's always it's always with the connotation of you're pro you're gonna die easily, or or it's a, or some sort of multiple actor passion play like in Ars Magica. Whereas with this one, I could ease with Heavens and Heresies, I could easily see people wanting to do multiple characters just to explore multiple play styles without without feeling um, pigeonholed. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I could. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, Monk. I could see a two-person table here. Your GM and a player with like four characters. Like I couldn't decide. These are all really cool. And the GM's just like, "Okay, play them all." What? Play them all? <laughs> well, just do it, you and me. Come on, let's do this. One shot. You can get an idea of their of their play styles. Let's start them. I don't know something like eighth level. Mm -hmm. How about you have a nice, nice little grouping of features to play around with? Play them all. Now, of course, mu of course, much like much like last time, there's there's only there's only a, there's o we can only have we can only have an assessment of something like the Herald to a point because we have because it's going to be a little while before we delve into um, spells. I would like to point out that. Um, as stated, as as alluded to in many of the dev notes concerning spellcasters we've gone across, and as to what Tanner has told me specifically, uh, or us specifically, there are all of 15 spells. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just basically add secondary effects to them to, to customize and every caster has uh, secondary effects and spell points that they can impose to create or spend to create additional secondary effects. Um, what's going to vary is the access to the pool of secondary effects, how many they can give for free, etc. Things of that nature, etc. Mm -hmm. um, some of the spells that we've heard, especially looking back at Druid and uh, at a uh, at what we've seen here, you've got your your uh, elemental spells, things like you know fire, ice, earth, lightning. You've got rejuvenation and wither, which sound to be two sides of the same coin. One is healing, and the other is damaging. So your positive and negative energy. Mm -hmm. We've seen here in in bard that we have enthrall and madness. Um, so there's there's a, there's it seems to be a single word descriptor of this is the essence of what you are casting. Now apply secondary effects to customize it to do what you want. And I, it's 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 going to be a while before we get to it, but given that, I am I will be very interested in how the wizard is handled because the five E wizard is. Quite, po quite possibly the quite possibly the worst take on wizard I've seen in any edition, because it is so fucking vanilla. It's super super vanilla. It is so it is so vanilla. You may as you may as well get you may as well get it. You may as well get a scoop of it at Cold Stone or some shit. Well, you would get a scoop of it at Cold Stone. Me, I'd get some chocolate. Chocolate chip. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, I'd actually probably get a fruit flavor. Strawberry or dragon. Have you ever had dragon fruit ice cream? It's really good. But rails. <laughs> but the the thing is the thing is with the ch with with the with the with, with the um wizard um Everybody, every other caster gets gets interesting things, and all the wizard gets is more spells, which means they have to deal with concentration bullshit. That's all. I haven't that's... seen a single mention of concentration thus far with spellcasters. Mm -hmm. I get the I get the feeling Tanner doesn't like didn't like that rule as much as we didn't. I get the feeling that Tanner and 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 we are just really good friends at this point. <laughs> But with that said, next week we have the Inquisitor, which I'm pretty sure is not going to be like the Pathfinder Inquisitor. 
and inst it is going to be an it is going to be another caster, but I get the feeling that this is going to be our investigator archetype. Um I actually don't think it's a caster. Um No it, I'm looking at it now. It gets casting right out the gate. Intradasting. Now granted the Pathfinder Inquisitor also did, but the um the Pathfinder Inquisitor was was meant to was meant to be a different spin on the um, cleric. In fact, let me hold um... on. This is a gish. Oh, we're go we're going we're going gish. This yeah. is a true gish. Let me. S Ooh, monk! Now I have to wait a week for this. Damn it! your fault you you're to blame and anyone who gets that reference gets a uh charles atlas cookie of approval <laughs> but that will that will do it for this particular episode of the valley of the judge like i said we'll be back here next week for when we cut when we cover the inqui the inquisitor I will try my absolute best to not make any Monty Python jokes. As because fuck... nobody expects the Monty Python jokes. Fuck you. <laughs> I said nothing about me not making Monty Python jokes. <laughs> now, as, far, as, far as, as far as 40k Inquisitor jokes... I'll make I'll make all the ones I want because because there's, because Games Workshop can't sue me for them. Sanction extremists. I think we need to visit an exterminatus on Games Workshop. I would, but that would also mean Cubicle Seven wouldn't be able to put out books anymore, and I still want them to finish the uh, their take on the Enemy Within. Why uh? Why why uh? Why do you think uh, Cubicle Seven would, would be prevented? Because they because they're the because again they're the ones handling Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I said Games Workshop. I said nothing about Cubicle Seven. Hmm. Anyway, we will see you here next. We will see you here next week. Next week, but this su but this Sunday, we'll be del we'll be delving into tabletop in a different form. So hope, hopefully I'll hopefully I'll see you all then, and of course I've still got a few I've still got a few more guests before the week before the week is out. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>